Good afternoon or good morning or even good evening wherever you might be joining us from around the world. My name is Anushka Sharma and I'm your MC for today's activity here at COGX. It's day two of the festival. It is, um, you're currently watching the Planet and Smart City stage. And our next session is really exciting. We're going to be learning and hearing about adaptation and resilience and managing climate risk. Um, please make sure that you get involved Send us in your questions for the panel when they kick off. You can do that in the chat function in Hopin, the event app. And also you can join our conversation online. Use the hashtag COGX2021 and we'd love to hear your commentary. I'm really delighted to welcome our moderator for this next session. Um, please welcome Chris Gunnis, who's a journalist and broadcaster of the Myanmar Accountability Project. Chris, welcome to COGX. Thank you so much, Anushka, and to those listening, and indeed our panellists, let me say buckle up for 40 minutes of high energy chat. As Anushka said, the title of our panel is Adaptation and Resilience, Managing Climate Risk. And to be clear, the risks are massive, growing and increasingly expensive to manage. The number of climate-related disasters has increased threefold in the last 40 years, and an unprecedented one in 33 people worldwide will need humanitarian assistance this this year. In addition, the international finance system is nothing near fit for purpose. Between 2010 and 2019, the World Bank crisis response window took an average of nearly 400 days to release funds following a crisis event, which significantly hit aid effectiveness. So how should the international disaster preparedness system respond? How do we ensure that the most vulnerable countries are prepared for crises and that the most exposed people People are protected? How do we fix the financial system? And how can technology help people, business and governments adapt to climate volatility? I'm joined by Zoe Scott, Head of Multilateral Programs at the Centre for Disaster Protection, and Iggy Bassi, CEO of Servest, which empowers enterprises, governments and financial services companies to manage and to adapt to climate risk. Welcome, Ziggy and Zoe. How are Iggy and Zoe? How are you both? Good. Um, Excellent. Good, 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 good. Zoe, let me start with you, if I may. We've seen sure. announcement over the weekend from the G7. I know you've been doing a lot of amazing work, you and your colleagues, to advocate for robust G7 action. Be honest, did you get what you wanted? <laughs> Great question. And um, so I know that there was quite a lot of um, disappointment expressed by uh, charities and different organizations in the media over the weekend, well, Sunday, as a result of the G7 communique. Um, and um, but there was there was some good news. If you um, if you poured over the communique language, as I did, you will have found buried in paragraph 41, there was the commitment for hundreds of millions of new finance for early action, disaster risk and insurance. Um, and this kind of went under the radar. Um, it wasn't, Boris didn't talk about it in the, um, in the press conference afterwards, but there was a press release that was released by the, the UK, UK government um, later on Sunday, which committed the UK to giving 120 million pounds and Germany to give 125 million euros um, specifically for disaster risk financing. Um, and it also mentioned that the US was supportive of this, but appeared to have forgotten their wallet. I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> they didn't give any any money. So, so there's there's some progress in that they offered some more funding for this issue. But actually, what we were asking for, we weren't asking for more money. We were asking for the money that is already given for crises to be given in a better way. So we were looking for systemic change rather than than more money. So the issue for us is that most and um, what most people don't understand is that most disasters are actually predictable. So if you can predict a crisis, you actually can put the financing in place ahead of time so that it's yeah. ready, it can I, be triggered and it can go straight away. So if I can just interrupt you, I want to get onto this issue of pre-positioning yeah. the financing in a minute. But before I do that, a quick reaction from Iggy to the G7. I mean, Iggy, what was your sense of how it went? I mean, I thought Zoe's answer was very, it was precise, but quite diplomatic. Uh, what about you? Yeah, I'm probably less um, diplomatic, Chris. Uh, first of all, um, thank you. Thank you very much for um, hosting this. I think the G7 could have done a lot more in terms of greater commitment to decarbonization. I think there's one aspect of financing that's woefully weak, which is around adaptation financing. Uh, 
things are predictable. So how do we think about early early interventions and how do we think about smarter adaptation financing? Um, so we can not only predict, but we, we can also then figure out what would the scenarios be for things like human cost, human security, um, um, access to aid, for instance. So there are just a lot more complex scenarios we can build today. So it's a bit disappointing not to see any new commitments per se. I think these are all like 100 million um, here and there. It's not really gonna move the needle. Okay, Not listen. To the problem we have, Iggy. We'll come back to get you to draw some of that out. But coming back to Zoe, what I love about your advocacy, Zoe, and I've you know we've spoken before in the past, is that it's very clear. You have talked about three critical conditions: predict better, prepare better, protect better. Now, after the G seven, are you confident that the needle has moved even slightly on any of those three? Um, well, we had, when we started as a campaign about a year ago, Chris, then we, we had these three asks that you mentioned. So we wanted there to be better coordination of risk information. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as Iggy will know as well, there's a lot of risk information out there, but it's not pulled together in a coherent way. And I think we've really experienced that with COVID. Like if you were a health expert, then you could have said, yeah, coronavirus pandemic is highly likely but nobody else knew that. And so nobody else was, there was no, no body in the global architecture that was responsible for sort of hitting the red panic button and making sure that people were prepared. So in terms of our first ask about having better coordinated risk information, unfortunately, no, I don't think there's anything that the G7 have done that's gonna help on that. Our second ask was around, um, if you can, if you can predict a crisis, then put the finance in place ahead of time for it, like make that the default way that we pay the crises rather than humanitarian appeals which are slow and they're ineffective so no i don't think they move the needle on that one the third ask that we had was around prioritizing support to the most vulnerable countries and that's the one where i feel like they have done something that they've made this funding available they have said that they want it to be for climate vulnerable and poor uh, countries and communities so uh, as part of the crisis lookout coalition that i i'm sort of representing today then that's what we really want to push is that that money it doesn't just get spent on you know um, maybe middle income or high income countries but it really focuses on uh, risk to the poorest people that can push them further into poverty and really pose a threat to lives and livelihoods. Zoe, I want to come on in a second and ask you to talk a bit about the most vulnerable, because we often have this debate, you know, in our homes in London, um, and actually we're talking about people in vulnerable situations in the Maldives, in, I don't know, in, in Africa, in, in, in Bangladesh. But before I get that, can I just remind our audience that we are very lucky and indeed privileged to have two extraordinary guests with us today. Please leave questions for Iggy and for Zoe in the chat room. Leave your name as well and perhaps where you are, and I will uh, put those questions to our panelists. Zoe, as I mentioned, um, paint a picture of the kind of communities and the kind of individuals whose lives are going to be directly impacted perhaps for the worst, unless we get this right. Um, okay, sure, Chris. So um, we know that it's always the poorest countries that are disproportionately affected uh, by climate disasters. And within those countries, it's always the poorest people, and it's women and children in particular, who are um, most affected negatively by disasters. So for example, we know that malnutrition kicks in around four to four months after a failed harvest. So if we know that, we, we also know that um, humanitarian appeals, which is the primary way that we, we pay for crises in the mo at, at the moment in the world is we sort of wait for the disaster to happen and then hand around a begging bowl, that takes longer than four months to pull off. As you said at the beginning of this, Chris, it took an average of 398 days for the World Bank's crisis response window to pay out. We also, um, at the Centre for Disaster Protection where I work, we've been doing some research into actually how slow is, is the current system. Um, and it does it consistently across all different types of disasters. It takes um, months and in some cases years for the funds to come in. And so by that point, malnutrition has already kicked in for a family. So a, a family would um, engage in what are called coping strategies so what would you do well first of all you would reduce your food intake right so and um, as a result of covid we know in many countries families had to drop down to one meal a day one meal every two days you know that that has long-term impact on on a child's 
health and educational and developmental prospects. Um, we also know it, um, you might take your girls out of school because you need them to go into work. You might sell off some of your assets. There are all these kinds of coping strategies that people employ because the money doesn't get to them early enough, because they're not supported. So from the research we did, I mean, some of it was just really quite shocking. The cyclones, which are a very, very predictable sort of disaster, it took um, after 18 months, on average, only 18% of the funding had actually come in after 18 wow. months. Well, you know, there's a whole lot of suffering that has happened so can I just interrupt you quickly? Would you name and shame for me here? Sorry to put you on the spot. I didn't give you notice of this, but who's responsible for that shocking state of affairs? Well, five out of every six dollars of overseas development assistance comes from G7 and EU countries. Mm. So I don't think, you know, we talk to developing country governments all the time, right? And they want a better system. They are trying to put things in place. Um, so that they have more predictable finance, so that they can plan, so that they know what's going to come in and when it's going to come in. So you have very, very poor countries like Mauritania actually buying drought insurance out of their own money. But it's the G7 countries, and this is why we were really targeting the G7 this weekend, and we're going to continue with COP um, in 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 the autumn and the next G7, is like they're the ones who have created this system where it's a very undignified system where vulnerable countries are forced in this into this position where they just don't know what money is going to come in for it, for events that are really very predictable. So let me ask you to explain to the audience, because for my money, the advocacy which you and the coalition Crisis Lookout have been doing has been extremely effective in many ways. I mean, just chiving the G7 along is quite an achievement, glacial as it might feel from your perspective. Just tell the audience a bit about the work that you've been doing, the coalition and what you're trying to do. You've mentioned the COP, but just take us through that a bit. Sure. So I think we realised quite early on in COVID that something had actually shifted um, and that people living in G7 countries were now beginning to understand things that people like me had talked about for decades about you know preparedness and disaster risk that actually people now intuitively understand why actually you need to have plans in place for this sort of thing. So we started talking to a whole range of different organizations last summer um, so different humanitarian agencies, development organizations, the private sector, academics and realised that actually there was a lot of momentum. People felt there was a window of opportunity for us to really push at a much higher level politically for this agenda than we'd ever done before. And so we launched in January this year, uh, the Crisis Lookout Coalition, and we now have over 40 different organisations signed up to that, including five UN agencies, um, lots of private sector organisations, civil society networks. Like This has got really broad appeal. This isn't just me saying, this is crazy. I mean, it really is a bit of a no brainer. Yep. I've not actually had a conversation with any organization and said, we don't agree with what you're saying. Like everybody gets it. And so a quick like 30 seconds on what you would like from this audience listening to what you've just said in terms of supporting this process. So go and check us out on the internet, crisislookout.org. Um, I'm. It would be great to have more organisations join up to the coalition, sign our statement of support. We're going to be thinking about how do we move forward, how do we influence COP. That's what we're going to be working on in the next few weeks. But the more the merrier. Please, please Brilliant. sign up. OK, I'd like to bring in um, Iggy to talk about the origins of where he came from and this amazing thing, um, service, which I'd like to talk a bit about in a second, because there's a lot to get your head around, actually, to be frank, yeah. um, especially to a non-specialist. But take me back to 2015. There you are in Ghana, you own an agribusiness, mm -hmm. and then suddenly your life changes. What happened? Uh, yeah, so I, th I think towards the end of the um, uh, project, we just kept seeing very extreme events, um, shocks. Um, some of our crops were taken out. In fact, some of our um, core infrastructure was taken out. And I try to understand, well, why, why aren't we getting these signals? Why aren't the weather systems, the climate systems, why aren't they informing me as a, as a business owner, as an asset owner, as a farmer, to say, well, these events are highly probable. And that led me to set up Sauvage to say, why is it that the world's most demanding problem has sciences which are trapped in very, very complex models and can't be used by, by um, everyday people? Uh, 
just just one thing though, um, because I just want to go back to the general framing around G7 because this is very much a, a government response. But I think there's two big criteria that have changed over the last decade, and we're seeing it more and more. I think the surface area of of risk has radically changed, is changing, and is really predicted to change. Iggy, just explain surface area of risk. I don't want to lose anyone. No, no, no absolutely. So when we think about climate risk, so. Um, climate risk has narrow corridors or has previously had very narrow corridors. But over time, what we're really seeing is disaster getting played out in slow motion, um, rising temperatures, rising volatility. So when we talk about people who are affected by disasters, it's also the Californians, it's the Australians, it's the South Africans, right? So I think from a, you just have to view this from a broader lens of disaster. What is disaster? Sometimes um, if you are highly dependent on the climate for your livelihood, disaster in slow motion, um, motion means rising temperatures over the next three or four decades. What does that do to your crops? Therefore, what does it do to your livelihood and how do you think about migration? Right. So a lot of the migration patterns are not just driven by one event, but they're driven by disaster, which gets played out over several decades. All right. So we need to think about this, not just as single events, but a slow motion disaster as well. Mm. Now, tell, tell, tell me also about climate intelligence and Earth scan, because one of the five big vision asks of this conference of COGES is that we champion and we put the spotlight on emerging technologies that are innovative and that you would like to see people champion. So the floor is yours, Iggy Bassi. Uh, no, uh, well, I mean, first of all, it's a huge problem. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is to say, how do we move climate intelligence to a realm that people can understand? So we're trying to personalize climate intelligence down to people's assets, um, companies' assets, government's assets, so we can think about the responses, we can think about the early adaptation. I mean, our ability as a species to measure, monitor, track, collect data has never been greater um, as a species. It was only a couple of years ago that we could image a black hole. So we can collect data today, Chris. Um, I don't think we're doing it at the pace that we should be doing it relative to the magnitude of the problem that we have in climate. Now, if I were to tell Chris that, you know, Chris, Chris's enterprises are about to be affected in the next, you know, 15, 20 years for the very first time across multiple variables, because climate doesn't really rest on a single variable, you know, you have to model multiple variables. If you were if you had that intelligence, what would you do with it, Chris, if you knew 10, 15, 20 years early, or even if you knew one quarter early? Think about the interventions that you could make. Um, think about the intelligence that you could share with your partners. How would you think about your response rate? How would you think about adaptation investments, more targeted um, investments? You could think about fortifications. You could think about flood defenses, for instance, right? So can, can, you, give, can you give me a real example? I mean, you, I, you've spoken before about hotel chains. Supposing I owned a hotel chain and I come yeah. to you and I say, help me manage my climate risk. Yeah. What in the real world would you be telling me to do? So I would be looking at every single hotel across um, your various geographies. We'd be going back in time to say what's already happened to this location or this asset. What will happen to this asset under different climate scenarios? But then what would be the impact as well? How much value am I likely to lose over time? What's going to happen to my occupancy rate? Uh, because that's the core driver. Because I think what we're not factoring in today is the forward risk of climate risk in today's valuations, in today's actual decisions. So for a large hotel group, where do I put up my hotel? Do I put up a hundred meter hotel next to the coast in the next 15 years, for instance? So we were able to guide investments because it's only by making infrastructure more resilient that we can withstand some of these forecast temperatures, some of these forecast hazards um, over time. So it's really important that you should think about climate intelligence as a new superpower because the climate problem is not going away anytime soon. This is not just about the race to zero. This is about living in a very different physical reality. How do we think about exposure? How do we think about the vulnerabilities? How do we plan cities better? How do we think about economic growth better, for instance, right? So think about it as a new form of intelligence that everybody needs to get. So we want to make the platform as democratic as possible. We want to pre-populate the world's physical assets so everybody can see each other's assets, right? Because I don't think we can wait for climate literacy for, so sorry, for everybody to become climate literate overnight. It's just not gonna happen, Chris. We don't have the time to do that.
Let me come back uh, to Zoe, because as we were saying, Zoe, one of your prime conditions is to predict better. When you hear Iggy say these extraordinary things and you know talk about climate information as a new superpower, how are you going to use that in your advocacy and in the next few months, perhaps even years, to promote this idea of better predictions? Um, yeah, so I'm going to be borrowing his analogy of it being a new superpower. I think that's excellent. Um, I completely agree with everything <laughs> that, that Iggy has said. You know, the risk inf there is risk information out there, but it's siloed and it's quite piecemeal. So I think of it as like a giant jigsaw puzzle. We've got all the pieces, not quite all of them, for some geographies and for some sorts of disasters, we actually need to do a bit more work. But overall, we've got enough jigsaw puzzle pieces but we haven't put them together and that's the critical thing that I think we need to do um the other thing that we're not very good at is um is using the information that we have to actually predict what's the what's the dollar impact on poor people how can we actually um use it to figure out how much money is needed to go to to different places and when is it does it need to go to them so that's the piece of work that needs to be done she's sort of given you your your next few months perhaps even years sort of you know strategic objectives Iggy. you know how are you going to fill in those yeah. gaps that zoe was talking about yeah i think the first thing to first is just to work with the policymakers to say how do you get access to intelligence that's also open um, intelligence, but also fundamentally, how do you take that intelligence and link it to your decision making capabilities? Because it's always right, scientific data has been around for decades and decades and decades, just never been personalized down to people's individual decisions or um, assets. I would just invite Zoe to say this is um, taking this intelligence beyond poor people, right? Because it's the people who own the infrastructure that allows a response to happen for the poor people as well. So it is government critical infrastructure that we also need to have a look at as well, right? Iggy, just tell me a bit more about the work you're doing to get the bigger picture. I mean, how many of these assets that you have spoken about have you actually mapped? I mean, how complete is that jigsaw puzzle that Zoe was talking about? So we are in initially focusing on what we call uh, the uh, built environment, so, so physical infrastructure, so buildings, hotels, um, power plants. Um, and we've mapped about 170 million of those assets globally. Yeah, by the end of the year, we're hoping to have over half a billion um, of those assets, which is a significant footprint of the total percentage, right? Then next year, we'll be bringing on uh, what we call natural assets, so forestry, farmlands, peatlands, um, natural sort of natural areas. So over time, we can start understanding, but more fundamentally, we can start borrowing statistical strength from one part of the world to the other part of the world, because it is true to say that the distribution of climate change will definitely happen in countries which are poorer, which are less resilient. Um, so we need to get that intelligence into those countries relatively quickly. But I want to be able to say, let's link that to financing. Let's link that to BlackRock's next um, syndicated loan that they want to give to, I don't know, Bangladesh, for instance, right? Because if they can understand how to encode climate risk at the very inception of a project, then they can understand how to adapt that asset to different regimes that that asset will see in the next five, six decades, right? It's really important that... You understand that the bulk of the infrastructure that is getting built in um, emerging markets is not climate resilient, Chris. As you and know, who, who's, you and know who's this. are we talking here about government responsibility because that's where the policy begins, or are we talking about the responsibilities of business? Listen, um, Chris, I think we need to move beyond just government as a single actor, right? Yeah. So I think yeah. you have to think about everybody. So this is a this is an open intelligence platform for businesses, for um, citizens, for policymakers uh, for banks, right? You can't just blame the government. I mean, the government's not going to be there for every single bailout, right? Mm, I mean, yeah, see the cost yeah. of COVID over the last couple of years. I mean, imagine if you have three or four major climate disasters, government's not going to be able to bail out every single time. Right? Yeah, and no. insurance companies are not going to bail out because they also get smarter over time, right? Yeah, yeah. I think we've got Zoe back. Zoe, are you with us? Yes, I am. Sorry. No, 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 no. That's, no. that's fine. Um, we, we talked a little bit in your absence um, about how we were going to fill in 
the gaps, filling up the jigsaw puzzle right. um, that you talked about. Um, you've said that you'd like people to be less vanilla in their ambition. Um, if we focus again on what Iggy has been talking about, about using this technology smarter, not just blaming governments, relying on governments, but businesses, communities at all levels, how do you think things can change, particularly to achieve um, the second of, the, the second prepare, sorry, the third prepare better, uh, protect better. How can that change if we start to take up on some of these amazing technological innovations, intellectual innovations, if you like, that Iggy is all about? Yeah, I mean, it's quite a different vision for the world, actually. I think we've become so used to, you know, oh, here's a news story about um, something, a drought that happened in a country and, and the suffering as a result of it. And it's quite a different world we're proposing. We're proposing actually knowing in advance about that and um, donor countries and humanitarian organizations and NGOs being really quite smart and sophisticated as they're thinking, right, this is the amount of money we've got overall and we are gonna be quite systematic and sensible about how we allocate it across these different disasters that we know are coming. So one thing that happened with COVID because nobody was prepared for it and all the decisions were made in a real rush mid crisis, was that all the money went to the wrong place. We've done places, we've done some analysis, which found that the 20 countries where poverty was projected to rise the most as a result of COVID, they only got 4% of the funding because it was all done in a mess. So actually, this is a very different vision of the world where you are aware of your risks, you can plan for things, you can actually make sensible decisions to ensure that the people who are gonna be most affected get the help that they need. So I want to throw at you something which Iggy touched on. You know, he said very clearly we should move beyond blaming governments. And, you know, you've always been working with governments, but your advocacy takes you to all other sorts of places. And you've used a phrase which I find very attractive, which is democratizing climate intelligence. You didn't use it on this panel. You've used it on a, uh, another context. Just explain how we democratize climate intelligence. I mean, um, that, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Z Iggy, if, you, if you'd prefer to jump in, I'm happy. Or... I think it was Iggy's phrase. It sounds more like him than me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so first of all, if we can personalize climate risk, why can't we take it over digital platforms to people? Like every time they take a loan out for a house or they're thinking about a um, new purchase or if a government or if a large business is thinking about acquisitions, if you're thinking about new um, infrastructure, don't put it up until you understand what is likely the physical hazard that's likely to affect the probability of that asset withstanding certain changes um, over time. So anybody can come onto the platform um, by the end of the year, sign up, create an account, look at all their assets and say what's already happened, what will happen and run different scenarios, right? And that's a very powerful tool to have. We want to put it into multiple languages. We want governments to fundamentally use this type of tool. We want the new disclosure standards to start thinking about quantifying climate risk for, for um, different companies. How much risk am I carrying in my portfolio, right? How do I rectify that over time? How do I adapt to these assets? How do I make them climate smart, right? It's really important because I think if you want to stay within a Paris aligned world, there's just no way you can rely on a handful of actors to get there. You have to democratize intelligence and you have to link it because people's in incentives are then linked to that intelligence as well. I hey, need we've to got care of my asset. Sorry, so. we've got in this room, champions, you know, leaders of business, captains of industry. How, give me an example of how your work has changed a specific company or a specific sector. Well, our work is fairly early. So we spent the better part of um, the last five years in research and building. So we're now launching and we've just invited 20 major companies to come and use the platform to say, do you actually understand your risk? Can you baseline your risk today? And then can you make a better investment tomorrow? Because your shareholders and your stakeholders more fundamentally will be demanding this type of intelligence because they too will see this, right? So we have a very powerful concept. I see what you see. Right. So we want to get away from companies um, trying to quantify climate risk for themselves and keeping it internal. Let's turn it around. Let's let's look at everyone's intelligence and say, let's have a grown up conversation about who needs to rectify and adapt their assets over what time frame. And let's give them the right interventions they can make to say, 
Chris, you're more exposed to wind patterns. So how do you think about fortification um, of your structures, for instance, right? Because um, not only do you dissipate your shareholders' wealth, you also then think about the vulnerability of your infrastructure, particularly in poor countries. Poor countries spend half a billion dollars on downtime because of very poor infrastructure. But that has massive cascade effect for people who then rely on that infrastructure and also their livelihoods, right? And that can be that that can compound very, very quickly. Uh, Iggy, can I ask you what kind of take up have you had? You said it's early days, but what kind of interest have you had from the corporate world? Very strong interest. Um, one, I think we've got a we've got a wonderful problem, which is called a massive regulatory push. So I think that disclosure laws have caught up with large companies. They have to start thinking about quantifying their exposure. But we would also like to see governments quantifying their exposure, Chris. You know, governments still constitute a big fraction of of our GDPs, why aren't we measuring their critical um, infrastructure? I've lived in Ghana, I've lived in Brazil. I can tell you the infrastructure they're putting up will not be resilient in 20, 30 years time when they see the types of hazards they're expected to see. Again, can I ask you a little bit, not necessarily to name and shame, but to tell us which governments you think are declaring their exposure and being more upfront about the risk they're exposing, let's face it, their taxpayers to? Very little. I mean, I I think it just goes back to the original point. A lot of the world's climate sciences are stuck in silos. So it's very difficult to say, how do I make them decision useful? And that's precisely what we're trying to do. But we're trying to do it in a way that can speed up change as well. So uh, sure, I mean, there are some Nordics, um, which are very good. Setting net zero goals is just half the trick. Understanding your physical exposure is the other half. And that's fundamental because you're going to see more disasters. You're going to see more livelihood risk because of physical risk, not because of decarbonization. They both need to work in tandem. Right now, we, we are rushing to decarbonize the world, but we're not quantifying the physical risk and thinking about the real investments in um, adaptation, which we fundamentally have to make. So I'm really interested in this question of disclosure, because it seems to me that if you are going to prepare better, then you simply have to know from governments how exposed they are. What's, what's your take on that, given that you've just been lobbying the G7? Yeah, I mean, I think there's something really interesting what Iggy was saying around um, creating incentives for governments to um, actually take their risk seriously. And if they're required to disclose, um, particularly if you're a country that is reliant on foreign direct investment, really, you only want to disclose if you know that you're definitely going to get some help that you could, you know, otherwise it's, it's a big risk for you. So, and I think there's also something about um, risk information can create incentives if, 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 communities themselves who are vulnerable actually know what they're vulnerable to they right. can hold their governments to account yeah. much more strongly than if if nobody knows iggy right. please i can hear you wanting to come in no no absolutely which is why you have to democratize intelligence yeah. now there, there are there's some information that you know zoe it's going to be very unfavorable for certain parts of the world but isn't it better to know that yeah. now and have a grown-up conversation rather than yeah. waiting for the disaster totally i totally agree and i think too many of these conversations happen behind closed doors with like ministries of finance um and it, that's just not appropriate we can't carry on like that there needs to be accountability uh, to the people who are actually their lives that are at risk but they don't even know it they don't know it okay uh, now i'd like to bring this together. We don't have any questions in the chat, which is a shame, but I would like to conclude, first of all, by reminding us all of what the ambitions of COGEX are. One, inspiring current and future generations of leaders. Two, moving conversations forward with concrete actions. Three, celebrating the latest innovations, especially those related to the COVID-19 recovery and climate change. Four, continuing to champion equality, diversity and inclusivity. And then finally, getting to net zero and reframing the climate emergency in terms of opportunity. Let me bring in Zoe, first of all. Um, where do you think we are in those? Where, where do you think we've actually made some progress? And where do you think we really have got to kick, you know, whatever? In this discussion that we've had? But not just in discussion. I think this discussion has actually thrown up an awful lot. But what perhaps from this discussion would you like to see filling in those gaps in the areas I've just been, been outlining? So I think there's something that I encounter quite a lot when I talk to people about this whole agenda, which is that people uh, find it hard to believe that 
better is possible. Um, I'm not really sure why, because you know we've we've made some massive breakthroughs in the last year, even with like vaccine technology and things like that. So we have a saying at the Center for Disaster Protection where I work, which is that disaster shouldn't be surprises. And yet, I think every time I've said that to somebody, they've looked surprised. So that's the key thing that I would like to to the message I'd like to say to people is like, we actually don't have to carry on with this crappy system that we have. We actually can go for something much better. So in terms of like saying to COGX, which is about sort of people having ambition and thinking, having big ideas about how the next 10 years, the next 20 years could look different. This is a real opportunity for change. Things could look really so different to how they do now. And can I just ask you to be clear, less crappy does not mean more expensive, does it? No, I, I mean, we're talking about the money. So like the, we've talked a lot about the World Bank's crisis response window. That's two and a half billion pounds, dollars. It will be two and a half billion dollars. In the last round, it's expected to maybe go up to five billion. That's money, it's already sits there. It already gets given out for the disasters. We're not talking about adding more to that. That's, that's okay, but just make sure that gets out the door quicker and it really goes to the places that need it the most. Uh we actually have a question from Joost van der Maart, um, who says, where in the world is least at risk of climate disaster? That's it. That turns it on there. We normally talk about where it's most at risk. But um, interesting. I, I've got no idea. But um, Zoe, um, Iggy, where is least at risk? Um, well, there's part of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but I would say that the general trend is uh, largely negative for most areas, but it's just a distribution, right? Okay. So, but I mean, the, listen, there are opportunities within climate. There are net beneficiaries of climate. There are certain crops you can go in new geographies for the very first time. There's infrastructure you can put for the very first time, right? So this is not just about risk framing, which is why we purposefully call it intelligence and not just risk analytics. That's yeah, important. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, okay, I, and I, I'm sorry, I would sorry, just say you. on this, it's not just about geography as well. It's about poverty. If you're poor, doesn't matter where you live, you're more climate vulnerable. OK, we've got two and a half minutes. I want to turn to Iggy to react to that list of five of the ambitions of COGX for this. I mean, where would you like to see us going? Innovation, leadership. Uh, what's important for you in all this? Uh, I think fundamentally there's a new superpower that the world has, which is um, large distributed technology that we've never had before. Humanity has never been so well connected. So how do we use that to say we all face a common risk? I mean, COVID has been a great example of how governments, large companies can come together and pioneer things in a very, very quick way. But it's also a rapid reminder of what can happen if risks get out of hand very, very quickly, right? Climate is getting played out every single day and every now and then, and an extreme event will happen, something will happen. So it's not just about disaster in slow motion, it's also about all the events that are likely to happen going forward. How do we respond to that? How do we think about collaboration? How do we think about accountability as well, right? Um, so I'm not really answering your question, Chris, because it was such a multifaceted <laughs> question. <laughs> no, 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 but, but just, just what do you think, if there was one priority ambition for this, whole event would it be around innovation would it be around re leadership in, in a couple of sentences it's always about leadership um, but how do we how do we give the leaders the new superpowers to make better decisions and how do you make them more accountable right um, i would like to see a more transparent world around climate risks and okay, also and risk generally and a quick a quick 10 second reaction from both of you and we really do then have to end are you optimistic less optimistic more optimistic given what we've just seen at the G7, given what you feel of the lessons learned from the pandemic, that we are actually moving in those directions? Uh, Zoe, you perhaps first of all. I am optimistic, pre predominantly because we've got COP coming up in a few months time, so we can build, carry on the momentum, and because we've got the US joining the conversation, so I think there's, there's a real opportunity there. Despite Mr. Biden forgetting his wallet, which is yeah. how he began. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll forgive him that. Okay, and Iggy, from you, a, a, a last reaction. Optimistic, pessimistic, and what do we do to inject a sense of optimism if you feel there perhaps should be more? Uh, outside the G7, um, deeply optimistic, um, but we have to drive towards people's incentives. You have to align incentives to people's behaviour. So very, very well, optimistic. Okay. On that, I think, 
guardedly optimistic note, I'd like to thank our wonderful panelists. It's been really, really great being able to air some of these ideas, to hear you know, this extraordinary work that you're both doing and um, all power to both of you. So my thanks to Zoe Scott, Head of Multilateral Programs at the Centre for Disaster Protection, and Iggy Bassi, CEO of Service. And with that, I hand back to Anushka. Thank you very much. Chris, thank you so much for your masterful moderation there. I <laughs> love it. It's my pleasure. It was, it was fantastic. Um, there was no, like, there's no risk of any hard questions there. And I think that's what we're here to do today is really challenge and really think about what the advancements are that, and the change that we want to see in the world. So a huge thank you to Chris there who moderated that session for us. Um, also, thank you to Iggy and Zoe, as Chris mentioned. That was an amazing session on adaptation and resilience and managing crime climate risk. Thank you for your questions. Don't forget to keep sending those through on Hopit. Our next session here on the planet and smart city stage is going to be about energy transition, a digital twin for the energy sector. We're going to be um, going on a break, but that session is going to kick off at 2 p.m. British Standard Time. We really hope that you come back and join us for that topic. And later on today, we're going to hear from NASA's head geneticist, um, Christopher Mason, who is going to be speaking at four o'clock on what is an amazing fireside chat that I'm going to be hosting with him actually about taking humanity forward. Um, and it's uh, the next 500 years, a plan looking very far ahead into the future. So I hope to see you back here at two o'clock, grab some lunch. Why not take COGX out with you, put your headphones in, take the app with you and go for a stroll and get some fresh air, um, stretch your legs and we'll see you after lunch. See you shortly. Thank you.